Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to the 359th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly um, reading and lecture series founded by Ben Catcher. Um, my name is Austin English. I've been working with Ben on the last two seasons. I'm very, very excited for tonight's guest, Lisa Pearson of Siglio Press. Um, I... Um, one of my favorite books, one of my favorite uh, collections of comics um, is this book by Dorothy Iannone, which I'm holding right here. And the book is uh, You Who Read Me With Passion Now Must Forever Be My Friends. And my interest in comics and um, through writing, through making art, through publishing comics is often um, a an appreciation for comics that explore comics themselves, the medium itself. Um, there's so much cartooning that we spend a lot of time focusing on that's cast in a literary tradition, a cinematic tradition, um, comics grasping at some kind of seriousness through through the lens of other media. And often they do they, they comics in that vein do amazing things. But I think if we look at the turn of the century with comics, the beginning of comics, um, you know, the, the earliest newspaper comics, we see a tendency for comics to truly explore what this medium can do and, and things like. Crazy Cat, um, Lionel Feininger's The Kinder Kids. Those are those are still some of the most beautiful um, expressions of the medium, suggesting uh, a potential of word, words and imagery exploring what they can do together that no other medium can do that I think has been amazingly unexplored um, and, and untapped. And um, the publications from Siglio um, are, I don't know what the... Um, um, I, I don't know what Lisa's uh, political reasons for for uh, her line of publications are. I'm very excited to to hear um, from her. But just as a reader, not having much context other than these books, I feel a real um, a real expression of the potential of what words and pictures can do with the line that she has published, um, more so than most other self consciously artistic comic lines. And so. Um, Everything that's come out from this press, from work by Joe Brainerd, Ray Johnson, Iannone, um, not only have they been articulations of what I think this medium is capable of, they have also been uh, rare books uh, within comics that do the artist a real dignity, that do the work justice. They're printed not just uh, with care, but but for readability. And and I think that shows a real dignity towards the artist that that shouldn't be as rare as it is. So I am um, very excited to to hear um, directly from Lisa. I'm going to read a bio right now. Um, Lisa Pearson is a publisher, editor, designer, as well as the founder of Siglio Press, an independent publishing house driven by its feminist ethos and committed to publishing uncommon, book, uncommon books that live at the intersection of art and literature. She lives and works in the Hudson River Valley, New York. Now, before I kick things over to Lisa, I want to say, as I always do, part of the the uh, thinking behind the symposium is a unity between speaker and audience. So if you have questions for Lisa, do not hesitate to ask them. You can put them in the chat as she's speaking, uh, and we will have time for Q&A and discussion uh, with Lisa after her presentation is over. So without further ado, I'm going to kick things over directly to Lisa Pearson. And L Lisa, I I'm sorry, I think you're muted. If you want to unmute yourself. There we go. <laughs> that, always, that, always, that happens to me too. So I'm going to mute myself now. Okay. So thanks, Austin. And, and, and truly, you know, if you have any questions, please interrupt and ask. And um, I won't be able to see the comments because of the way my screen set up, but um, Austin, you'll be able to relay those to me. Yes, I will. I will. I'm going to um, I will read the comments after or people can put a note in their comments that they'd like to read them themselves, but they will all be relayed to you after. OK, great, great. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and let's see here. Share and view slideshow. Alrighty. Does that work? Is everybody seeing that? Okay. All right. So um, usually as the publisher of Siglio, when I'm invited to talk, it's a lot about the book as object and about its materiality and its presence. 
It's about the space of the book and its intimacy and the book itself as a means to shape a reader's experience in the way that it is held, touched, and paged. I talk about what Siglio means and what, it, what its mission is. I also talk about small press publishing, which is exactly what you see there. Um, I don't think I've ever talked about comics per se, but I think Austin invited me to participate in the symposium because a few of the books I published, some that he named, um, may be on somebody's bookshelf who's here uh, and they intersect quite literally with comics. Um, but I called this uh, uh, talk sideways between sense and nonsense, a heterodoxical wander so that we can sprint through a few titles that have no outward resemblance to comics, but do share one very important common denominator with comics, the presence of image and text that makes the acts of looking and reading inextricable, the admixture of image and text that makes, makes it more, much, much more than the sum or mirror of its parts. So almost all books by Siglio, uh, almost all Siglio books are, are works by artists and writers or artist writers or writer artists who use image and text, but rarely in an illustrative or explicative relationship. And no matter how they're playing with image and text, those conceptual and formal choices are very much in the service of an artist writer's intention. And often they invite the reader to read and look in quite unexpected ways. So I'm just gonna move through a few examples of these. Let's see, why is that not working? Ah, there we go. So the first one here, when sometimes it seems like the work, uh, the relationship might be illustrative, but in fact, it's sort of reorient. So this is Ellie Goss square octagon circle. And she's literally, as you see her hand holding up a picture that references a story that she's talking about that's on top of an image that's appropriated from a book that's telling another story you understand that while it is sort of literally illustrating, it is also doing a number of other things to complicate that story. Um, similarly, memory, um, let's see, wait a second. I wanna make sure that, can you guys see the left-hand part of my screen here? Let's see with the books. Well, anyway, um, memory. I, I can see the spread of book. I mean, it's like okay, two pages yeah, see, and, it, and uh, uh, something that says memory on the side. Right, okay, well. That means that those things are, well, I'll just leave it, it's fine. Um, so Memory by Bernadette Mayer, which I published in 2020, was a work that she did in 1971 in which she did this experiment to see if she could document everything that she witnessed, participated in, thought, remembered um, for the entire month of July, uh, 1971. And um, she uh, wrote, uh, during the day, and then she also uh, photographed a single roll of film. And so sometimes these texts and images match up, sometimes they don't, so they're diverging, they're converging, they're documenting, so what she says in text may not appear in the images at all. So that while it seems like it might be very illustrative, it's, it's really not. <laughs> um, and then in someone, you know, the work of Sophie Call, who's a French conceptual artist, you know, you, you think that it's illustrative, that here is something that is happening or here is a place that she is and she's documenting it. But Sophie's work, which is all investigative uh, works that are um, uh, circumscribed by certain kinds of restraints. For example, the address book, which she found on the street in Paris, she copied the names and numbers, sent it back to its owner. And then she began calling people to find out about the, the address book's owner or Sweet Pinetienne where she follows a man to Paris or in the hotel in which she gets a job as a chambermaid and uh, brings her uh, uh, camera in with her bucket as she cleans the rooms. The thing about Sophie is that it seems like it's reportage and it seems like there might be a one-to-one -one relationship between those images and text. But as a critic, uh, Lawrence Rinder wrote, Sophie's work is a Petri dish of doubt. So there's always something there that is not quite true and you never know quite what it is. But in any case, so moving on, then there are works where the image and text um, uh, relationship is subverted. So here's Katie LaRocca in a book, you'll see a number of 
works from this book today called um, It Is Almost That, an image text, a collection of image text work by women artists and writers that I edited and published in 2011. And here, what is pictured is clearly not what is subtitled. Um, and that tension is what's really important to that work. And then in another by Louise Bourgeois, um, it wants to sort of act like it's telling you what, like it wants to act as if the image is illustrating the text. But when you look at that text, once there was a girl and she loved a man, they had a date next to the 8th Street station of the 6th Avenue subway. She had put on her good clothes and a new hat. Somehow he could not come. So the purpose of this picture is to show how beautiful she was. I really mean that she was beautiful. And so I love this work because what those what that picture does um, is certainly not literally what the text tells you. Um, then next up, there's artists and writers who want to disrupt, uh, expand, complicate, transform the act of reading itself. These are two of Adrian Piper's political self-portraits. Um, generally, uh, Adrian Piper's work is shown in galleries, and these are really big pieces, and they're really hard to stand in front of and read. So I really wanted to include them here so that you could read them. But of course, the way in which she presents them is a certain challenge to legibility on purpose. Um, then there's also Ray Johnson. Um, this is part of Not Nothing, Selected Writings by Ray Johnson, 1954 to 1994, that was edited by Elizabeth Stuba. And you can see just by <laughs> cutting out part of one page or making a little incursion into another that he's saying, how you read from left to right, top to bottom is not going to um, work in this case. And then many, many other pieces from, I could have chosen a billion pieces from this book to show you. You know, you have to read around and through and things are layered and things are, um, you know, playful. And so it, he asks you to really read differently as does Helen Kamek. And this is my newest book, um, I Will Keep My Soul by Helen Kamek. And in this case, Helen, among other things in the book, uses transparencies so that the images are uh, revealed and obscured, so the text is layered, so that voices, so that there's a multiplicity of voices. Um, these are just three pages out of a sequence of about six. And as you move through them and you're reading this letter to the sculptor Elizabeth Catlett from a young woman uh, who is also an artist and is asking Elizabeth Catlett, how can I be a black woman artist in this world? And I think the letter's probably dated, you know, in the 70s, uh, late 70s. She's, she, you're also seeing Elizabeth Catlett at work and you're seeing her working on this piece, um, this commission of Louis Armstrong that the book uh, talks about in terms of her struggles for autonomy and agency and making that sculpture. So that's a really sort of fascinating way to kind of enter and engage the story um, uh, by use of the form. And then um, another piece from It Is Almost That is uh, woven weft by Anne Hamilton. And in this case, she's really <laughs> disrupting and asking you to read uh, lines with, oops, wait, what's it doing? Uh, lines uh, in a concordance. Um, and so it really changes your relationship, particularly because the sentences actually keep changing direction. Um, other artists and writers I published like Teresa Hot Kung Cha, whose uh, piece, It Is Almost That, is what I titled this collection after. Um, really want you to interrogate the, the structures of language using image, or in the case of Madeline Ginn's, this book was edited by Lucy Ives. It's called, um, uh, uh, The Saddest Thing is That I've Had to Use Words, a Madeline Ginn's Reader. This is excerpted from Word Rain, and you can see that she's really asking you to, to be, like, here you are holding the book. You are addressed to, to fill in the blanks. And then here it says at the bottom, this page contains every word in this book. And so she is really changing and altering the terms by which the reader engages um, the work. Oh, I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, so he, this is a case of when the sometimes the text is the image. This is F Felix Gonzalez Torres photostats, or in other cases, the image is the text 
This is from Karen Green's Braille sister. And similarly, this is from a picture is always a book by Robert Seidel, uh, further writings from Book of Ruth, or truly when the image is the text from Mirta Dermasace selected writings. Um, finally, before we get to sort of the more comic-like things, sometimes image and text is just simply chance determined, as in diary, how to improve the world, um, you will only make matters worse by John Cage. So um, Robert Seidel, let me just see here what's going on here. Robert Seidel uh, wrote, and as he's describing the species of writers and artists working within and in between image and text like this, such figures delineate for us a picture of the imagination as something more fluid, greater and more unwieldy than the categories uh, literature or art by which we customarily differentiate creative endeavor, a prolific be beauty, a beauty in a sense composed of the prolific shapes their work, multivalent and rife with the dispensations of the plural, the more complete art trembles on the cusp between the sayable and the seeable, the thing and its name, the visible and the invisible. So I think that to edge in sideways, I, I name this thing sideways into sense and nonsense. So we're moving into a more leisurely stroll um, with two women artists whose artistic fecundity resulted from the urgent necessity of articulating and expressing what they saw and expressed nowhere else. So Dorothy Iannone, who Austin mentioned earlier, and what and Nikki de St. Fall have a lot in common. Um, you can see that they're they have a very vibrant palette, that they're they, their work is on flat fields of color. The figures are often outlined. Um, it's often exalting the female. They're both autodidacts um, and often use image text in the single field. They are both steeped in literature and they both lean into narrative and storytelling, particularly, story, particularly being frank and candid and um, often quite funny. Um, much of both of their work was indirectly or indirectly autobiographical and often addressed to friends and lovers. So it's really personal communications in some ways. And they also both consciously challenged taboos and patriarchal definitions of women, womanhood, sexual relationship. And finally, they, they both had men as muses, um, but they are quite different. So I'll start with Dorothy. Um, I recently wrote a remembrance of Dorothy she died, gosh, December 23rd, maybe? It was right before Christmas last year. Um, and I'm just gonna read you the first paragraph. And like everything that we just rushed through now and things that even, uh, we, we won't, you won't really have an opportunity to read so closely. Tons of this stuff is on my website. There's lots of excerpts from the books um, and this remembrance is there in full. So. I wrote uh, on, oh, it's so December 26th, 2022, Dorothy Iannone passed away in Berlin, her home since 1976. She was a self-taught artist who made exuberantly sexual, joyfully transgressive, and often autobiographical image text works, radical in their inversion of binaries, and often tender in their incorporation of lovers and friends. She worked tirelessly in obscurity for decades, relegated to side note status in discussions of Dieter Roth, Emmett Williams, Robert Filou, and others. Then, in the last 15 years of her life, she achieved the recognition and admiration that had long eluded her, or perhaps better said, what she achieved in life was finally recognized. So that's partly why I did this book. Um, Austin and I were talking earlier about how one might have heard of Dorothy, but it was really hard to find her work. Um, I encountered it first in books called Dieter and Dorothy that were collections of correspondence between the artist Dieter Roth um, and her, which were beautiful, beautiful books, but everything was uh, in, it was all tied to Dieter. And um, it was clear that there were a number of other publications, artist books that had been published also by Hans-Jörg Meyer, who published a lot of Dieter, uh, Dieter's material. Um, but you could not find them. I mean, they were so rare, so out of print. And I also seemed, it also seemed to be that her work was sometimes really dismissed out of hand because um, it was flat, because it was, uh, you know, 
not multi-dimensional and it felt like it was sort of graphic and sexy and 60s and but what what the problem was at least to my mind was that you couldn't actually read it and so you know just as austin alluded to earlier simply was really really committed to legibility and in this book i wanted to present works either in their entirety or in in really extensive excerpts uh so that you the reader can really read all of it and read it together and and read uh into and so even in this case with this piece flora and fauna which i think is really the centerpiece of the book um, at its heart you can't actually read those little what's in those little hearts so it's transcribed to the left and why i love this piece so much is because um dorothy is all about inversion she's all about the thing that is one thing and another, or the thing that can be something else entirely. She's about paradox. She's about um, turning things inside out. So, you know, she inverts male and female. You can see sort of, well, not this one, but you'll see another one sort of how the genitalia kind of merges and, you know, her hers is quite testicular. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of things happening in terms of exchange between male and female. There's a lot of sacred and profane. There's muse and maker, submission and dominance, but there's also something else, which is super, I find super compelling. Um, Trini Dalton, who wrote an essay for the book, wrote, um, one is invited to look at the text visually as much as one is invited to read the imagery. And you, you really can't, um, you really can't engage her without those two acts inverting. And this is, this is partly why. So here's the piece that is kind of her creation myth, an Icelandic saga, and it's about going on a freighter with her friend Emmett Williams and her husband to Iceland to meet Dieter Roth and how she, this sort of attraction with Dieter explodes and she ends up leaving her husband and going back to Dieter. And she's writing this, um, you can see on the side, uh, most of these are all uh, screenshots from the books. Um, you can see it's from 1978. And this happened, I believe, in 1967, it says. Yes. So I'm just going to go through this so that you can see. You won't be able to really read it, but pay attention to, like it says, lists one there. That's important in her work. And you can see how every single page she makes particular to what she needs it for, for that moment in the story. Um, and every page is composed differently. So here at the end of part one, um, she has these, <laughs> along with a list, she has these little charts, which I find incredibly endearing as someone who likes charts. Um, and then she begins the part two with the synopsis. And I'm not, I won't show you the part two, but this is the first time she tells this story in this form and it's a it's a story that she among other stories tells over and over again but in different ways and that's another thing i'm really interested in her work are these sort of revisions and the slippages between them sort of how one thing changes over time and one of the things that she does do in here let me see if i can find the page um uh yes here it is on the right hand side page 10 one evening, dear and loyal reader, this is, of course, a premature autobiography, and you who read me with passion now must forever must be forever, my friends. Um, she is always invoking us, the reader. She wants us in. She is singing to us and talking to us and including us. And that is also something that's really critical about her work. So here, um, after she's with Dieter, he asks her, as you know, men often do, uh, who have you, you know, had sex with before? And so Dorothy creates another autobiography listing. I think this is list, I can't quite see it, but it's one of the lists um, and illustrating each encounter of hers. And this is just a part of it. Um, and then she also takes uh, this story of her uh, love affair, I mean, very deep, intense love affair with Dieter Roth, and she turns it into Danger in Dusseldorf, which is uh, uh, 
presented here in facsimile in its entirety because it is one of the most difficult books to find. Um, I Printed Matter told me that they'd never even had this book in their catalog system. I mean, it never crossed uh, Printed Matter's doors. Um, but this is, I think, the, the fever dream masterpiece of the work. It may not have the same kind of succinct urgency that Flora and Fauna does, but it takes this story with Dieter and turns it into Anahaza and Otohaza um, and this bizarre thing that happens to them with the heirs to a soap dynasty. I mean, it's, it's, I can't even really quite explain it, but it's, it's really, truly um, amazing. And I, I, I failed to say actually that this book um, that I edited uh, really charts her search for ecstatic unity. And um, she's really interested, I mean, she's so different from her contemporaries, uh, her feminist contemporaries, and that she was really all about sex with men. I mean, that was very important to her, but not because of it was sex in general with men. It was because she felt the way to find transcendence and to be sort of liberated was to have a sense of a static unity with the one that you love. It's all about this sort of relationship, um, doing something really extraordinary and freeing. And, and, and it's often you know, she depicts it in, in very carnal ways, but she also, in these two little uh, sets of, of episodes, um, she also is really into the quotidian, you know, and the really banal, like, move over, okay, put out the light, I can't, it's on your side, you know, so she's, she has this way of sort of mixing in, um, you know, what is sacred to her in a static unity, but also the profane of the daily life. Um, she does the same thing here and sort of interprets their uh, relationship into tarot cards. Um, and then this piece, um, it's one of the most interesting pieces in the book. And I, and I didn't show you sort of the first version of it, but these are some of the images that she's best known for. But the texts that accompany them shift and change. And in this one, this is where one of the, the bigger slippages happens for me is where she's really thinking, is this is this is this possible? Am I, is it, am I really experiencing a static unity? What is it that I want out of this? Um, and yet the very sort of, you know, graphic images of, you know, you can see everybody's both Dieter and Dorothy are playing uh, submissive and dominant. And, um, but it's, it feels like it has more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It feels like it has a more contemplative approach, even though the, the imagery is incredibly um, direct. So um, if you get the book, you'll see how that changes. And then what the other thing that she does in this one is the cookbook. And what I love about it is that, you know, where, where you have to sort of read between the lines without her knowing, this one, she's really asking you to read between the lines. So she's got this cookbook and meanwhile, she's sort of keeping a diary in it. She's sort of talking to Dieter, but she's also addressing her friends. Um, and, and this one might be my very, very favorite. Um, uh, and it really is writing into the food and the making of the food. And that's another thing that's amazing in her work is this sort of you as the reader are really ingesting all of it. Um, okay, so uh, on to Nikki to St. Fall. Um, this is a really different book, even though there are some common denominators. And one of the differences is that its author is Nicole Rudick, um, even though it's the parenthetical autobiography of Nikki de St. Paul. And um, Nicole set out to, if you don't know about Nikki de St. Paul, she's an artist who um, you may have seen the Stravinsky Fountain at uh, the Pompidou Center, or you've heard of the Tarot Garden in Italy, or seen the playground in San Diego. She's known for making these just incredible, fantastical structures that sort of bring, um, bring a whole different sort of world to life, you know, in the very uh, sort of banal world that we exist in. It just becomes colorful and playful and, 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 and extraordinary. Um, but she also 
did a lot of autobiographical writing drawings and Nicole approached me and said, I, you know, I'd really like to do something with those, but I really want to do a biography. And as she was researching and she was reading all this material that people were giving their memories, uh, saying their memories about Nikki and, 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 and their uh, memories or their accounts of things, she realized that she didn't really want to base a biography on the perceptions of other people of Nikki. Instead, because Nikki, you know, was really narrating her own life through all kinds of different work, she thought, why not then um, create a biography by letting the writer speak? So she writes in her fantastic uh, forward, the, the forward and the afterward, um, you know, I, it was very hard to choose what to, what to share with you because both of them are, are immensely interesting um, uh, uh, works, but what could be closer to the artist's voice than the artist's own voice, closer to her sensibility than that produced by her own hand? St. Paul left behind two memoirs of her early life and a vast trove of drawings, prints, writings, letters, poems, books, and sketches that respond to or comment upon her life and thoughts. And artwork for St. Paul was not an object, but an act ritual, performance, public, revelatory of her personal life. Art gave her wholeness. It gave her the ability to talk about loss and pain, mistakes and successes, collaboration and creativity. It gave her the ability to talk about joy. I bring to life my desires and my feelings, my contradictions, longing, forgotten memories, shadows, visions from some other place, she writes on a sketch. The duality of this statement of bringing to life is an appsimation of the overlap of St. Paul's life and art, both a bringing into existence and a bringing to bear. These are visions from the frontiers of consciousness. In living, she gave these sensations form. In her art, she gave them life. So Nicole creates an almost chronological uh, narrative using Nikki's words and images but they're really, it's really it's almost a chronology of her consciousness because there are things that are not said about her childhood as she's initially uh, writing and, and discussing her childhood that she only comes to terms with later in her life. So those things are revealed later in the book. Um, but what I wanted to, there's so much I could have shown you. I mean, there's just, this is a three, as the Dorothy and Noni book, it, it's almost a 300 page book. Um, but I wanted to choose some things for the purpose of this conversation that really felt like they express Nikki's being inside the process and motion of thinking, you know, whether she's taking notes, doodling, drafting, revising, or if she's making a finished work. And, and I will point out that this is quite different from Dorothy's work. Dorothy, besides the cookbook, um, everything else is very finished. Um, but, but Nikki, it feels like everything's always sort of in the making. And even when she finishes things, you'll see in sort of these later works, they feel like they could just almost keep going. So I love this piece of the eye, um, when she's addressing to her very young lover who she marries soon thereafter, Harry Matthews, the Lippian author, um, the eye is always there, your eye, my eye, the look, our look, the registered moment, your eye, your eye, my eye. Do your eye see what I see? You like the strange cacti in my garden, the gray green, the green surprise, an orange blossom at the top. Our eyes felt the same emotion. I like watching you look. I mean, it just feels, you know, just so in the moment. And then later in their relationship, she ends up, um, going to a hospital in Switzerland, um, you know, to really wrestle with uh, mental illness. And on one side are, uh, is, a, is a narration of it that uh, Nicole uh, found, but on the other side is a very different way that she expresses what the experience of being in that place was like. Um, and, you know, that we juxtapose the two, I think, it does something quite interesting one to the other. Um, this is a drawing that she made for um, Mr. Eolas as a proposal for a work. <laughs> and you can feel the intense energy of it. And, um, you know, 
uh, the demons you'll see, she come up again and again. She's sort of always wrestling with her demons. Um, this is on the left is sort of like a map of a body. Um, and then on the right is perhaps my very favorite piece in this book. It feels like the, if I were, if I had to choose like one manifesto of being a feminist, this would be it. And, you know, one of the things that Nicole and I uh, made a very conscious decision about is, you know, when to typeset and when to leave something in the original handwriting. And it was really important to leave this in the original handwriting. Um, I like roundness. I like roundness, curves, wavy lines. The world is round. The world is abreast. I don't like the right angle. They scare me. The right angle wants to kill me. The right angle is an assassin. The point of the right angle is a knife. The right angle is pain. I don't like symmetry. I like imperfection. My circles are never perfect. This is my choice. Perception is cold. Perfection is cold. Imperfection gives life. I love the imaginary, the way a monk can love God. The imaginary is my refuge, my palace. Imagination leads me inside what is square and what is round. I am blind. My sculptures are my eyes. Imagination is the rainbow. Happiness is imaginary. What, Im what is imaginary is real. And that feels like so much, um, uh, you know, in what drives her work. Um, this piece I, I included because it, you'll see a, a little bit of a revision of it um, next, actually. But you can see where things have been erased. You can see her sense of duality, sort of negative on one side and the positive, you know, this idea of, you know, what is eternal life keeps coming up in her work. And this uh, also um, sort of, if you see down on the left-hand side of the screen, she has all those things again. And this was made decades later. Um, and she's still turning things over and you can see the thinking, but you can also see what's jettisoned and what's kept for the thing that, you know, is clearly shown to other people, but the other that's kept private. It's the same thing here. Um, she did these uh, uh, pieces, a series called Tears, and it was shooting at these white canvases that seemed blank, but once she shot at them, they sort of burst with color. And, um, you know, it was a pretty radical kind of work. I and mean, Nikki was really beautiful. And, you know, so here was this beautiful woman holding this gun, shooting it, and it sort of turned, you know, the kind of anger um, that people associated with feminists on its head. Um, and it's no, but it's no less, it's no less angry. I mean, it's, it's amazing in its sort of anger and outrage, but Nicole had both of these things in the, in the, as, as a possibility. And uh, she was very interested in what didn't end up in the end. So if you see, they're exactly the same, except for the last line on the left. I shot because uh, it prevented me from going mad. And that wasn't in the, the final piece. Um, then, uh, as I mentioned before, she writes to friends and lovers. These, in the book, there are these beautiful long letters, often with a frontispiece that she's drawn. In this case, she was writing to Clarice Rivers. Um, and there's a poster here for her first really big show in Sweden. And this is the one thing that most people know about Nikki St. Paul. She created this enormous uh, uh, woman called Han. And you, her legs were sort of splayed as if she was either giving birth or you know, awaiting. And, and you entered through her vagina and inside of her stomach um, was a whole world. There was a place to watch films. There was a place to get a drink. There was a place to hang out there. You know, it was just, it was like you entered a whole other world um, inside of this woman. And so this is the poster and she writes to Clarice on the poster, these sort of very newsy items. She's also, you know, I think um, in one, in one thing, she's really talking about how difficult it is to make this thing happen. She wants to know about what's happening in Clarice's life and, and it feels really spontaneous um, and beautiful. And she colors in obviously the Han for Clarice. Um, and then she makes things for Clarice. So, you know, invoking 
the Nanas, the Han, um, there's, you can see a, a demon there too. Um, and then she writes a letter to Clarice that's also drawn. And these things have, you know, a really different kind of intimacy, but the, the kind of care and work and thought that's devoted to one person to whom these things are addressed is I find tremendously moving. Um, she also made something else that I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I very well may be, but I think she made this for her son. Um, uh, a friend who was an immunologist asked her to make a book about AIDS to help people understand AIDS better. Um, but if I remember correctly from the PS1 show, the MoMA PS1 show, that this was also, maybe it was dedicated to her son in the beginning, I can't quite remember. But here's another way in which she uses the image and text and maybe a much more, you know, sort of comic-like way because it's sequential and it's, um, uh, you know, very uh, uh, much a book communicating a story of some kind, which is basically, you know, these are the things that you need to know. Um, use rubber, teenagers be careful. And then um, this one I love too. I mean, she's she's one of the things that really above all about Nikki that strikes me is how humane she is, um, how much she cares, how much her friendships mean to her. Um, you know, the the men who were her, her ex-husband, her ex-lovers, all always friends, still friends. Um, and this piece uh, really, as we were working on the book in the middle of COVID, um, really struck home. So, and then a lot of the other things in Nikki's work are her uh, works that are addressed to the beloved. And they are often great declarations of love. <laughs> and then they're like, well, that's over now. Um, and finally, I love this one because she tells, she says, what shall I do uh, uh, when you die? Uh, and at the end, you know, she says what she's gonna do and then I will forget you. And she moves on. And so that brings me to here. So this is a later work. And this is where I was talking about that sort of density and where it could just keep going and going. You just imagine that there's sort of be reams of these, these drawings. And these are, this is addressed to herself. It's dear, she has a whole set of dear diary works. And these are about sort of teasing out threads she's thought about men, what men have been in her life. Um, and then she gets to another one of these drawings and it's really about her. Um, she is not about men, it's about what she wants in life, how she imagines and envisions herself. So I want to take, <laughs> This is going to be a very odd digression, but it 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 does make sense um, for Siglia. So I want to now look at uh, another woman envisioning herself. And this is uh, Roger van der Weyden's The Magdalene Reading. It's a 15th century painting. And I often invoke it because it's really meaningful to Siglio in a lot of different ways. And um, this is a digression. <laughs> I hope it won't be too long of one, but I do want to say something about this book that she's holding while sitting on the floor. She's enraptured in reading it, but the book's hidden from us, really. We can only see sort of one, a bit of one page. And, um, and so we have to imagine the book. It's a small, it's singular, uh, illuminated manuscript, maybe prayer book, New Testament, Book of Hours, but it would have been at that time uh, the viewer of the painting would have known that that book would have been made expressly for her, um, that as its patron, she probably appeared in it, but she is also the Magdalene. So she is, she is in it anyway, sort of seeing herself in it, reading herself in it, too, in, in it, and then possibly even seeing how she's been erased from it. Um, and I know that that was not part of Van der Weyden's intention, but that's certainly what I see in that painting. Um, and anyway, that's, there's a lot there. <laughs> I don't want to digress too much, but the purpose of this tangent 
is that I want to point out that medieval illuminated manuscripts uh, that tell the stories of the Old and New Testaments are urtexts for Siglio. And they are considered a sacred text, the word of God, the book, the Bible. But for me, in my mind, it's also really a masterwork of appropriation, revision, and most importantly, collage. And as many scholars have noticed, the Old Testament uh, revised and rearranged stories from the Sumerians, Babylonians, Chaldeans, and other ancient peoples. New Testament uh, uh, gospels and apocrypha were discovered in the 20th century that had been lost, hidden, erased, buried, or perhaps even excised from what became the book as we know it today. And then this book, as we know it, what is ostensibly received as the word of God has traveled through multiple languages, it's been shaped and altered by the nature of each language, as well as by both the vision and blindness of each translator among a legion of them over an expanse of time and place. And for me, this book, the foundational text of Judeo-Christian culture and belief resonates because of all the invisible layers, uh, its multiplicities, contradictions, and absences, the juxtapositions of fragments, the retelling and revision of stories. And I don't practice any religion, but wow, this is a book that has been uh, millennia in the making, uh, held by so many hands and contrary probably to popular belief, it begs the reader to read in between the lines into the gaps and the silences. Um, the other thing about these illuminated manuscripts that they were not just sacred, but sometimes shockingly profane images at the center of the page might quite literally illustrate the story at hand, but in the margins, the space that I find most compelling as a, as a Siglio publisher, there's a field, a very fertile field of incongruities, contradictions, subversions, aberrations. The images that inhabit that space often undermine the literal, resist it, critique it, complicate it. Populated by creatures, imaginary and real, as well as humans engaging in the grotesque, crude and quotidian, the margins are counterpoint, bringing the invisible and the fabulous into a relationship with the sacred and the sublime. Those margins are expansive. They change the center by virtue of their relationship to it, and they extend far beyond the edge of the page as they point to a larger complex world of the flesh and the imagination. And as they literally and figuratively disrupt or recompose the space of the page, they ask the reader to read from various angles, to read not just in one way or in one direction, but many. And this is really at the heart of Siglio. So back, back on track, um, we'll move into a lot more incongruity, imagination, disruption, subversion, unfettered play, and collage. Um, Joe Brainerd. So many of you may know Joe Brainerd's work. Um, in the introduction to the Nancy book, which was the first book that I published um, in 2008, uh, Anne Lauterbach wrote uh, the introduction. Where did, let's see, where, oh, there it is. Um, I'll just go back in case you guys hadn't seen that one. I love that one. That opens the book. Um, she writes, Joe loved cigarettes, butterflies, tattoos, dolls, charms, postcards, peas. Joe's favorite flower was the pansy. Joe's favorite cartoon character was Nancy. Over the course of Brainerd's work, both Nancy and pansies recur, talismans within the shifting foci of style and medium. He enjoyed their specific uh, social cultural puns. They were part of a direct playfulness through which he mediated his identity as a young, shy, gay artist from Tulsa, Oklahoma, coming into the charged world of New York poets and artists in the early 1960s. The repeated visual puns, visual and verbal puns were not motivated by shame, but rather its reverse, candor. Candor, a kind of fearlessness about boundaries, or to put it more clearly, a way in which boundaries or frames might be employed to shift habits of thinking. So quite, quite uh, uh, almost in direct lineage to what I think of when I think of um, the illuminated manuscripts in some ways. So what Joe did, and if, you, if you're not familiar with uh, Joe Brainerd and his appropriation of Nancy's, I'm sure you're familiar with Ernie Bushmiller and Nancy, and you may have seen other artists appropriate her. But Joe, I believe, was the very first one. I think the first piece was in 1963. 
and he delighted and 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 made innumerable works, many of which are still turning up. Um, I get an email from, I just got an email from Ron Padgett a couple of days ago, sending me another one that uh, uh, was found. But he um, took Nancy and he sent her into all kinds of incongruous spaces. And the friction of her appearance in those places does all kinds of wonderful things. Um, some of the pieces are uh, really beautiful. Um, some of the pieces are worldly and sophisticated. Oh, let's see. And some of them are quite sweet and silly and personal. And these two are addressed to Ron Paget and his wife, Pat. Um, and then there are the works he does as part of the New York School, um, which is really, when you hear New York School, really it was a coterie of friends. And in this uh, case, Joe Brainerd and Ted Berrigan, in 1963 made this sort of first Nancy, appropriated Nancy comic. And those collaborations, um, Nancy becomes a springboard into the play, uh, uh, into play and the boundaries between sense and nonsense, into absurdity, into fantastic strings of non sequiturs. This is uh, the Nancy book that he did with Ron Paget in 1965 that was part of the very legendary C Comics 2. Um, and you can see just the, the thread of non sequiturs that's just really amazing. Um, you know, it, it, it gives them an ability to do something else that, you know, if you just had this language or if you just had these images, it is not the same thing. Um, it's a it's an incredibly alchemical admixture of image and text. Um, and then in this last one, which may be my favorite thing in the whole book, and I hope none of the people who are watching this are shy. Um, this was unpublished as far as I know. It was done with Bill Berkson. And you can see how far um, Bill and Joe can take the absurdity um, and uh, the use of poetry, uh, the play, the revelation in uh, the shocking and the profane. I think this might be, I just love the composition of these panels too. I mean, it's really, as funny as it is, it's also incredibly well composed. Okay, so this is the last of that, but I'm not gonna leave you with that in your mind uh, as you as we move on from Joe Brainerd. So here are a few more If Nancy's from the If Nancy series in 1972. But then maybe as a comic symposium, you'll appreciate this one. Um, okay, so next on this wander is Richard Kraft. Uh, and he's an artist who takes us even further and deeper into nonsense. And I don't know, the, the picture of me and Austin on the side here that I'm not looking at uh, maybe have covered up some of the uh, credits for the books, but he also co-edited the Felix Gonzalez Torres book and the uh, John Cage book. Um, he took a comic from Perestroika era Poland about a Polish spy who infiltrates the Nazis um, and in an incredibly exuberant act of detournement, he excises, he fragments layers, he breaks the frames, he expands and contracts time, he collapses foreground and background, and he populates uh, Captain Kloss's world with this enormous cast of characters appropriated from dozens of sources. Um, there's the Amar Chitra Katha comics of Hindu mythology, there's Jimmy Swaggart's Old and New Testament stories. There's 1960s um, uh, football annual called Scorcher, underground porn comics like Cherry, images from art history, outdated encyclopedias, etc. And it is cacophony, but it's in no way nihilistic. Um, in an interview at the back of the book uh, with Ann Lauterbach, he writes, let's see, here it is, um, isn't faith really about surrender. I believe that our great capacity for wonder can be tapped into when we relinquish a need for rational meaning. 
Thus, I have faith in questions rather than answers because questions on one hand can be inspired by the embrace of what is ultimately inscrutable. And on the other hand, by an irreverence, a skepticism of what we're convinced we already know. In posing questions, if we're lucky, we might get a momentary glimpse of a truth. And I think its fleetingness is as meaningful as what the truth might tell us. And here comes Kitty. I'm asking the reader to surrender and get lost in the act of looking, to be open to the possibilities of reverie, to the strange alchemy of one thing brushing up against another, to letting go of sense in order to discover different and multiplicitous truths. And as for Kitty, she is that multiplicity. She is many creatures, some monstrous, some sweet. She's akin perhaps to the Indian goddess Kali who destroys as well as creates. And I'll just move through some of these a little slowly so you might catch some of the things. You can see the speech bubbles are from all different kinds of sources using all different kinds of diction. Um, you know, some are the photographic images. Some of them are, you know, there's, there's actual personages populating this. I think Margaret Thatcher and Gandhi are somewhere, uh, as is Winston Churchill. Um, and then there's also these interpolations by the writer Danielle Dutton, who um, collaborated with Richard on this book by, uh, they sort of took on the same kind of process that Merce Cunningham and John Cage did in the sense that they composed for this piece separately. So Richard sent Danielle a few images to start with, and then she thought about how to not sort of ekphrastically describe the work, but instead um, invoke the experience of it. And honestly, I think there's no one else besides Danielle Dutton who could have done this. Um, she really, in all of her work, makes these incredible leaps and juxtapositions and is able to invoke like the feeling of something um, without naming it. And I think, you know, the way that that happens in the visual in Richard's uh, uh, collages and the way this happens in Danielle's almost textual collages um, is really, it's, it's a really magical kind of pairing. And so here's a couple more things. Okay, so last, last artist that I'm going to talk uh, in some depth about is Jess. And um, I don't know, Austin, you didn't mention Jess earlier. So I don't know what people's orientation to Jess might be, but he was part of the San Francisco avant-garde in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And later he and his partner, the poet Robert Duncan, their house, their home was really a kind of, of, of um, center for all kinds of cross-fertilization between artists and writers. He um, was trained as a chemist to begin with um, and left chemistry. I'll talk about that in a second. But the thing that, that if you're coming here through comics that you probably may have heard of are his tricky cab pieces. And this was something he wrote in 1969. Um, he did all the tricky cads. There were uh, six of them. Um, yeah, there were six. We found all but two, two cases, two and three lost. Who knows what happened to them? But in any case, this is work that, you know, when you think about this is being done in the 50s, you know, it is radical and imaginative and really extraordinary. So he says, uh, Tricky Cad scrambled out of Chester Gould's Dick Tracy to concentrate on eight cases in eight years, partly as a demonstration of a hermetic critique self-contained in popular art. Here was the sincerest form of flattery, flatly abhorred by the creator. And by the way, Ernie Bushmiller hated what Joe did with Nancy. Um, no additions were made to text, image, line, punctuation, excepting the paste, just compressions via scissors and Max Mister. The mimetic method kept true to the material in the original by panel, by day spread, week, month, or by episode. And the correspondences that came during the tantric process were a counterpoint of rhymes echoing events in the world, events unfolding in the original, personal events, and if getting into the heart of things is primary, Tricky Cat suggests that the aesthetic analysts leave off 
join the synthesists and spare us the extraneous insights. Um, we are gonna move too quickly through these for you to really enjoy them because they are really meant to be read word by word, line by line, really looking at the images because sometimes you think, well, wait a second, was that, was that what was there or is that what just reconfigured? Because sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, this is case one. Uh, this is all of case one. It's at the Whitney. Um, in this book, uh, Oh Tricky Cad, Another Just Eterica that Michael Duncan edited, no relationship to Robert Duncan. Um, this is the first time all the existing Tricky Cads uh, came together in one place. And that was part of what I, I was really hoping Michael wanted to do in editing this book that uh, emphasized legibility. Nothing, there was nothing that we included that couldn't be read at the size of the page. And that ruled out a lot of stuff actually because uh, Jess often worked in large scale and therefore to reduce it for you to see it on the page would make the text illegible. And the text is, is really important in Jess's work for its nonsense, for its poetry, for its romanticism. And then again, like uh, Dorothy, like uh, Nikki, like Joe, and even, you know, I think in, in Richard's case too, so much of this is about communication um, and love of friends. And this tricky cad was in a book for Patty. Um, it was just a whole notebook of things that he made for her. And that's now in the Smithsonian. Um, this tricky cad case five is at the Hirschhorn. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, there's another at LACMA and um, another that was published uh, in a literary journal. Um, that I, I don't know if the original is still existing. Um, another comic appropriation that Jess did was Nance. And a lot of Jess's work is uh, super playful and it's homoeroticism, really pushing on how to um, subvert, uh, uh, you know, the, the depictions of, you know, very manly men. Um, I love this one. And this is very this is, you know, not known at all, I don't think, um, is a really beautiful, powerful, funny, interesting piece. Um, yeah, okay. So that's one aspect of Jess's work. So this is from Michael Duncan's um, forward. Trained as a chemist, Jess created compounds of pictures, trimming with scissors and fixing with glue, a staggering range of cultural artifacts myths and personages taken from both fine art and the commercial world. These reshaped images are positioned in fantastic tableau of populated forests, cities and seas activated by primal forces of nature like gravity, oceans, ocean waves and gusts of wind. His is the ultimate revisionist history, one where multifaceted elements meld into each other in a protean alchemical periodic table. In many inclusions of images of laboratory equipment and the cogs of industry taken from turn of century copies of Scientific American slyly corroborate the meta-scientific method at work. Interwoven in the web of morphing images, various apparatus, tubes, cords, beakers, mirrors, coils, sprockets, facilitate the alchemy, transforming paper clippings into golems of romance and myth. So this is... Um, one of the first drafts of uh, for the cover of a book called O. Um, and I, you know, I, I'll be really curious if any of you think of this as a comic because it seems to my mind to perform like one in some ways. Uh, this is the cover that uh, became uh, the actual cover in O Tricky Cad um, and Other Jesoterica we reproduce this as a little chat book that you could pull out from an envelope. So it's its own little thing. And I'm just wanna walk you through it because it's, it's, its density is immense, but there's a way that you can sort of take in the whole too. I mean, you can go back and forth between um, seeing and uh, reading and there's a lot going on here. You can see the things that Michael was talking about with sort of the pseudoscientific. And then here on the right-hand side, you can see this little uh, 
string of, of panels begin. And so there's there are six there, and it's that uh, tale of the orange uh, about a little girl who's told that if she eats the, the pips of an orange, an orange tree will grow inside of her. Um, and that's the story, literally, that is uh, the text at the bottom of these panels, which are turned here, you know, in all of these on their side. So your orientation to the text and your orientation to the images is at least real, I mean, for me, very interesting and provocative and um, uh, bewildering in the best kind of way. And then it ends uh, on the left-hand side and then it picks up again from with the other little uh, poems on the collages and then shifts and ends here. And this is the back of O. Um, and then this is the last piece of Jess that um, I'll leave you with that you know, in a certain way, he can turn anything into a comic. I mean, the speech bubbles that he gives, uh, the uh, the sheep, um, the unseen voice from the sky. Uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's I don't know. I, I, Jess is really, Jess, Schwitters, maybe some might argue Ernst or not Ernst, but, you know, those are the masters of collage. But Jess does just something really different um, and beautiful. All right, so lastly and quickly, because this has gone on for an hour and I'm, I'm sorry if it's been a little too long, I've had lots to show you. Um, I wanna end with another illuminated manuscript and I'm sure there'll be the question uh, or possibly in your heads, you're thinking, well, you know, what's next? Uh, the artist, Chris Russell, has for several years been working on a visual translation of Witold Gomberwich's novel Cosmos, which is one of the weirdest, most interesting novels I've ever read. I mean, it is, it is so odd. And Chris has just done a deep dive. And these pages are, to me, even though they're rendered in black ink, sometimes white ink on black paper, they are like illuminated manuscripts. And he has hand let he is hand lettering the entire novel and then creating what is it is an illustration, but it is not an illustration. It really is a translation. And you know, like the other artists that I've shown you today, really uses each page in a different way, really thinking about what is what Gomberwich's words are and how to maneuver them spatially on the page with the things that he draws. Um, I mean, it doesn't get much more illuminated than that left-hand piece. He did these, he's been doing these on the subway on his way to and from work. Um, and he's been working on this for several years and I think it might be done in a couple of years. Um, it's been an extraordinary project, and I am so excited about it. I haven't seen, I'm getting, we're meeting in a couple of weeks to see the new batch of images and um, scan them. And you can just see, too, I mean, at every move, he's just trying something else out and experimenting with a different kind of drawing style, or sometimes he's using a brush. Um, and you know, switching the ink. I mean, he's just, it's, it's, it's also sort of constantly in motion. Oh, and so then I was gonna say, this is the, this is, this is the end of the talk. <laughs> so um, thank you for your patience and your interest. I really appreciate it. And let me see if I can figure out how to stop sharing the screen. There we go. Wow, that was that was incredible, uh, Lisa. Thank you so much, especially that that final um, thing you were showing. Is there any information on that uh, on the Siglio site so far? We'll, we'll all have to. You'll have, have to, to stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's already there's already a question in the chat. I um I have a bunch of questions noted down here. I'm gonna um out of politeness to our audience, I'm gonna limit myself to one. I encourage other people to ask questions. Um, I'm going to limit myself to one to start off. Um, 
But I, one of the things that really struck me was the uh, Van der Weyden piece that, that, that you showed and um, this idea of um, the the Bible, um, you know, d despite what people might think, um, you know, really begging for interpretation and interaction. Um, and I, I think that's very true. And I, of course, it, it makes sense that that image would be so important to you, um, you know, just with Ian Oni to begin with, as you said, she begs for interaction with her work. And I think what's striking about her is there is so much information that she gives in, in all of her works. It's all aesthetically beautiful, but it's all, th th there's a lot to, there's a lot to um, delve into there. She gives you a lot to work with. And um, you were talking a little bit about her career and her career being whatever it was uh, prior to the publication of this book and, and maybe not being as marquee as maybe some of her peers. And I do wonder, since most of the people you're working with work, you know, with maybe the exception of Brainerd being more known in literary circles, um, most of these artists are are people who um, more or less work in the, the, the world of visual art, the, the gallery world, or, or maybe on the trajectory of showing in museums. And I think there's a big difference in what Iannone does with, with um, giving this much rather than simplification, and and a more austere presentation of what they're doing. I'm wondering if if you see that difference with some of the artists you work with, um, as opposed to maybe um, visual artists of their same generation that had a had a different kind of career. Do you think that they they present information and a, a possibility for interaction in a different way than their peers, the people that you tend to work with? Do you do you see a distinction there? Um. No, I mean, I think I think the thing that with everybody I work with and some, you know, uh, some are, you know, like Sophie Call is really well known in the art world. But when I started publishing her, nobody knew her in the literary world. And part of my project was to really get her read, because at the time, all of the artist books that she had published were out of print. They were really expensive. They were inaccessible. Um, and, you know, she's 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 giving a lot to the reader but holding something back too and Bernadette Mayer who was part of that New York school she's most well known as a poet she also unfortunately passed away at the end of last year um this piece uh memory when it was originally installed at Holly Solomon's very first gallery space which was basically Holly Solomon's apartment um, in Soho in 1972, it would, there was a, a six hour voiceover that Bernadette had recorded of the text, um, you know, the entire month's text. And then there were, I didn't show it, but there were little three by five uh, images of every, of the uh, over 1100 images pasted into a big grid. And it was remounted for the first time after 45 years at the Poetry Project. And Bernadette's daughter told me that people would walk all along one line and go all <laughs> get to the end and then come back like a typewriter moving to, to see the images in the sequence. But meanwhile, they were hearing in their heads Bernadette's voice that probably didn't correspond at all with the image that they were looking at. So there was an incredible amount of information, as you put it, that behaved differently than the way that information behaves. And then furthermore, on that point, um, because it was COVID when the book was released in May of 2020, um, I collaborated with Poets House and we invited 29 or 30 poets to read an excerpt from each day in July on the day in July, 2020. And so all of these poets then voiced Bernadette. They sort of took on Bernadette's voice. So she became, you know, it sort of was uh, transferred in a way. So those levels of engagement, I think, happen in all kinds of ways. And, you know, I mean, Jess hasn't had a show in, I mean, he had, a, he had an amazing museum show that traveled, you know, I think in the 90s or something, but, you know, really off the radar. Brainerd is author, e even in the literary world, when I remember was reissued in 2001, that was the year that Connie Llewellyn 
curated a retrospective of Joe Brainerd's work. That was my very first encounter with his work, as was as it was for many, many other people. Um, and yet, even after that retrospective, and even with the reissue of I Remember, Brainerd, until about now, I think now it's sort of becoming a, he's becoming much more well-known, um, remained um, unknown in a lot of ways. So I don't know if that's really answering your question, but. Um, no, that's, that's very illuminating. I, I have a follow-up question, but I'm going to, um, I have a follow-up question to that, but I'm going to, I'm going to open this up to people in the audience before I loop back around. Uh, Benjamin Frazier, I'm going to read his question. He says, um, great talk. Thank you, Lisa. I'm very glad to learn more about Siglio um, and your take on these wonderful pages. You mentioned one moment in which you had to decide whether to typeset or use the original lettering of the artist. And I wonder if you had similar stories, or if not, I wonder if you have more thoughts about what hand lettering contains as trace of embodiment, as aesthetic contribution, as symbol. Yeah, well, I think it contains all of those things. And, um, you know, when you when you typeset, uh, you are making something really uniform and it's, you know, um, adhering to certain kinds of principles that that all typeset text generally begins with, even when it breaks rules, um, when you take something handwritten. And in, and in Nikki's case, if you move through the book, her handwriting changes and, you know, she's using different writing instruments and she's, do, you know, like just in the piece that I, she's using two different pens and, you know, so you do feel the presence of the hand and the human. And, you know, I do think it brings something. I mean, the, one of the other reasons I love that roundness piece is because it's not copy edited. I mean, there's spelling mistakes in it. And, and I, and I love that about it. When you typeset a text, you know, generally it gets copy edited, copy edited, you know, kerns, you know, you're doing all kinds of things to it. Um, and while we try to refrain from doing much to the typeset texts, um, you're getting a kind of pure, uh, you know, what, what is written by hand is sort of its most purest, essential first uh, expression. And I think that's, I think that's right. There's a question from, thank you for that question, Benjamin. Um, Michael Dooley asks, um, and Michael, uh, you didn't say if, you, uh, if you'd if you like me to read this or you'd like to read it. I can I can pause for five seconds if you want to chime in and say whether you'd like to read it. Um, oh, uh, yeah, I can. Uh, great, go ahead. Question. Hi, Michael. Uh, <laughs> hey, Lisa, good to see you again. Uh, this was, okay, reading the question, can you speak about uh, Tricky Cat in relation to the works by other artists during that? Era's Bay Area Bohemian scene, and here I'm thinking specifically of Bruce Connor and his underground films, mm -hmm. Cosmic Ray and such, and his assemblages and 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 such, and even if you want to go beyond that, you know the the Jess and and Connor and those artists as forerunners of the early 1960s pop art uh, movement. So, uh, oh, here let me turn on my. Yeah, there we go. Oh, so uh, see anyway. you. <laughs> hey. so, um, yeah, there, there's there's the question. <laughs> well, I I would imagine that you would probably be much better at answering that and would know a lot more than I do. But you know that for for people who may not know much about that time period, um, you know Bruce Connor was uh, a collage assemblage artist filmmaker, part of that coterie. I don't know if there was as much direct cross fertilization between like Jess and Bruce Connor as there was like say between Jess and Helen Adam who also made collages and wrote poetry. Um, but the, the best way to, for anybody to sort of find out more about that is to go to Michael Duncan's other book, Semina Culture, which um, focuses on Wallace Berman and um, and really sort of opens up all the tendrils of you know conversations and and influences between this extraordinary uh, group of people that was both in Northern and Southern California. I mean that's that's the treasure trove. And I you know I have not published Wallace Berman, but 
on the list. <laughs> oh, so. yeah, yeah. Well, Wallace Bird, yes. <laughs> Southern California representing, right? That's yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and definitely all sorts of tie-ins uh, uh, there. And I, I mean, when you look at uh, just to what extent do you see the, its relationship to pop art, maybe just in a personal uh, no, I, I, I just feels, you know, it's so funny. He pulls for me personally, and this is, this is, you know, this is not a critical um, or scholarly take at all, but for me personally, <laughs> personally, when I look at his work, um, he's pulling from all of these things that are in the world, but then he creates his own world and it feels in a way so hermetic, but so rich and splendid and, you know, self-referential in the way that it just kind of like there's a maelstrom at the center of it that just sucks you in. And I, that's what I love about it. I mean, you can just keep looking and reading and it feels infinite. It feels like you'll never exhaust it. It's a huge cosmos that just creates. What do you think, Michael? There, there's what you're addressing it, that that whole uh, kind of you know, West Coast, East Coast uh, sort of thing, you know, the pop being New York and uh, people like uh, Berman, Jess, and Bruce being out here and, and giving it like a really different spin that's, you know, that there's nothing that you could point to and say that's literally, you know, <laughs> whatever those, you know, <laughs> Andy and Roy, you know, we're looking at those, but it's it's just that that whole openness and, and mm -hmm. flavor and, the, you know, that you know, less of the distancing. It's more like, yeah, you know, you, you can feel the tactility of of those people's work. You know, you can you can feel the pulse uh, of. Yeah, obviously, I'm a big fan of uh, of, of Jess and the rest of them. But uh, yeah, that, it's <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go West Coast. Uh, and hmm. Do, do, do you mind? Uh, thank you, by the way. And uh, can I say another quick question? Of course, Here's, of course. Uh, jumping uh, to something else to getting back to Dorothy. Uh, I, I just want to know uh, if you ever considered uh, pu uh, public, and this is just jumping back to Dorothy, uh, publishing a Dita Roth book, perhaps one that highlights his visual narrative work with, with comics and, and children's books and, and, and such. And I... <laughs> One of the reasons I'm asking is back in the '90s, I was at the, the I was doing a feature story for Print Magazine on the uh, the Gettys artist books, <laughs> you know, g going back to the stuff that they have with uh, Marcel Duchamp and such, and they have a they had this magnificent Dieter Roth uh, collection, and <laughs> actually a little, little story and you can appreciate it, I think, give it context, but uh, there were I. There were photos being taken at the Getty for books by Dieter Roth, and it, that included some of the books where the pages were, were actually um, foodstuffs mm -hmm. that, that were in plastic. Mm -hmm. and, and, <laughs> and and when the people at, at the Getty were taking up the to photograph the the bookworks for me, they <laughs> they took up one of <laughs> uh, Dieter's books. That, that had sleeves that were that was cheese and plastic bags. Yeah, <laughs> and then they were lighting it. <laughs> the, whole, <laughs> the the whole photo studio went. But you know, in in terms of the you know, magnificent uh, things that he was doing with with comics back back then, and it's just and so much of it. I mean, you know, uh, just just was doing you know Sunday pages. Dieter Roth was doing graphic novels. <laughs> you know. With, yeah. with take and and which well, is a long way of it get back to the original question it's like uh Dieter Roth books with comics in it a thought you know I I love Dieter Roth and I'm you know I'm I'm you know first and foremost my biggest sort of influence uh you know publishing influence is Dick Higgins and the Something Else Press but Hans Jörg mm -hmm. Meyer who published that enormous library of Dieter Roth artist books is also stands out for me as, you know, a kind of progenitor. And, um, you know, I, I guess, I guess I feel like with Dieter, you know, there are other people who could publish him, you know, there are other people who would happily take that on. And, and, um, and so, 
one of the one of the criteria for me, I mean, there are many very weird, odd criteria that I have when I consider something to publish, but it's really partly, is anybody else going to do this? You know, if nobody else is going to do this, then that's where I feel like, okay, that's where I need to really look to see and lean into that. Dieter's, Dieter's covered. Dorothy was by no means covered. Oh, yeah. Um, and so that's, and, and, and I look, I, I just swoon when I see the, the artist books that have the comics. I, when I see the literature verse, when, you know, there's so many Dieter Roth books that I just love, 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 but he's, 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 uh, he's, he's, he's in the end zone. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody does it like Siglio. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Sure. Okay. I'd, I'd like to ask a little bit about, um, there is, um, part of your talk made me remember a, um, a presentation I'd seen by a scholar, um, a, a Charlotte Solomon scholar. Are you, uh, oh, yeah. And um, it was this uh, scholar, uh, Griselda Pollock, and she gave a very interesting presentation that kind of focused on, um, you know, the comment, how music was meant to be part of Charlotte Solomon's work and, you know, all the different all the different elements that went into what Solomon did. And, um, you know, she ends her presentation. And the first question from the audience is um, a, a female graphic novelist. And she says, well, um, you know, I've heard you speak before and you were resistant to calling Charlotte Solomon a graphic novelist. Uh, you know, I think that um, uh, current feminist um, graphic novelists see her as an inspiration. Uh, and, 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 you know, a, a, a proto figure of this form and, and, uh, Pollock, as I recall, is very resist. She, she continues to be resistant to, um, uh, having Solomon be part of this tradition for, for, I think, um, you know, we could, we could have a whole discussion over, over, uh, over that resistance or, or what it means. And I think some of it is legitimate. Um, so I have two questions with that. Do you, I wonder how much you care or how, how relevant you think it is that, this work um, uh, be thought of in the canon of cartooning or comics in general, if if Iannone and Brainerd should be considered alongside Harriman, Windsor McKay, people like that, how relevant that is to you. I, I have reasons that I think it's relevant to readers who might um, have an interest in the form, but need to see it in a different way than, than they normally do. Um, but I don't know, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you say. And I'm also curious, um, you know, as you you define Siglia with with feminist intentions, um, how just just the pure act of storytelling with imagery, sequential imagery, um, how linked you if if that's a big part of the project that you see as a, a, a useful form for feminist art that maybe hasn't been explored. Um, well, those are two pretty big questions. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even going to answer them first. The first thing I want to say is. I think Charlotte Solomon is the greatest unsung novelist of the 20th century. If yeah. people want to call her a graphic novelist, absolutely fine by me. But she is the the uh, live for theater song play, which was the cornerstone of the book that I edited in 2011. It is almost that an image text, uh, the collection of image text work um, is. I'm mean, like I could I could spend I could spend an hour on Charlotte Solomon. How that's I love her work. I think it's so underappreciated. It's so it's, misread. It's underrated. It's underrated it's for so sure. So underrated. And um and I think that there's a lot for any number of uh creative people, whether they're writers or comics or graphic novelists or novelists, to approach that work and find something extraordinary in it. So, so that's Charlotte Solomon. As for the ways in which, whether it's Charlotte Solomon's work or Dorothy's or whoever's, the ways in which that might be taken into a comics canon, you know, I'm all about expanding categories. I'm all about finding connections between things that were not perhaps seen before. So hooray, you know, I mean, <laughs> If it if it works and it speaks to something and it expands people's ideas of what the possibilities are, great. You know, I mean, I have, you know, honestly, I don't care what things are called. You know, what I care is finding 
readers for them in dis despite those categories, despite the designations. Um, and then what was the last question? Just maybe maybe more directly oh, talking the about- Oh, yeah. yeah, the feminist ethos. So for me, and, and this is, and, and you know, it, it varies and, and the, it is almost that book really, you know, I, I did that early on to really speak to these issues, which is to say, you know, uh, Eileen Miles, the poet, wrote this amazing review of It Is Almost That, and, and she gets totally to the heart of it. She says, it, women are always doing more. You know, we, we always do this and that and the other. And so in using image and text, I think women are looking for ways to find modes of expression, whether they're formal, whether it's semantic, that, that create a space that hasn't been there before for them, whether it's, you know, so there's a lot in literature now about making space for people to tell stories that haven't been told. But what I want to see are those stories told in really unusual and interesting and provocative ways in which form really shapes the experience of that story. And I think that um, these this species of artist writers are really capable of experimenting and pushing on the boundaries and innovating. And that's where the, for me, the sort of the fertility of the image text work, you know, really speaks to something deeply feminist, you know, that it's expansive. You see beyond the horizon. I mean, that's that's important to me. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, I um, we have time for we have time for someone else to ask a question. I'm going to ask um, maybe my my final question uh, in the meantime. Um, I think it's very. I'm I'm glad that you emphasize that the legibility um, is important to you in in the project that that you're doing with Siglio. I wonder with someone like Iannone, um, you know, because the when you read the works in this story, they translate to the printed form. So, you know, they, they there's not, um, this really does seem like how they should be experienced. And I wonder with her, did she try to um, perhaps publish short stories in, in this form and literary, I mean, did she think of, did she think of publishing this work in mass, you know, kind of a, a, a mass to mid mass literary way to, to, to get this work out that out in that way prior to, um, did she submit to magazines and stuff like that? Um, well, she, like a lot of people in her generation, you know, whether it's the New York school, whether it's Fluxus, you know, all of those folks existed in their own communities, producing their own things and making space for their work. There wasn't the kind of, um, you know, you didn't send your stories to the New Yorker when you were, you know, writing this kind of work. But, right. you know, she had pieces in this German magazine called Zondown. Um, one piece I I really wanted to track down and I couldn't find it. And she wouldn't, she wouldn't show it to me. <laughs> it's the only thing I couldn't wrestle out of her. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, Hans Jörg Meyer published her artist books. Um, one of them might have been published by someone else. They were editions of anywhere from like 150 to maybe 500. Um, but that's how a lot of artists, you know, male or female, distributed their work at the time. That's why a lot of work is still distributed and should be distributed. You know, I mean, I sort of am coming more and more to believe that, um, you know, you pass things from hand to hand in a human way to friends and loved ones and the strangers who you you know, serendipitously encounter. And that's, you know, I feel like in, as everything is so commodified now, um, that's more and more important. And I don't think, you know, Dorothy was looking to, for the widest channels of dissemination. I think she was just looking for some acknowledgement. You know, that's what she would have liked, I think, in any form that it took. Um, yeah, even if it's, I mean, not, to say even if is is the wrong way to say it, but if that acknowledgement just comes from someone in her life experiencing what she has to say. Right. Well, she has a little thing from Ben Vatier, the Flexus artist, pinned on her wall. And I, I quoted it. It's an epigram at the beginning of my essay. And um, it's really lovely. Um, ask Dorothy for the human touch, lost in art. You know, 
I'd take a Ben Vautier quote. That would get me on my wall dedicated to me. That would that would keep me going for a while. Yeah, that's enough. That's <laughs> enough for, for quite some time. And it's a, yeah. I think that's a beautiful, a beautiful note to end things on, actually. Thank you so much, Lisa. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, thanks for having me, Austin. And and I I I everybody who came, thank you. It's really lovely to do this. Oh well, thank you. Thank you for everyone who asked questions. And no, it was a it was a real pleasure. And I think for um for the programming that that this season has, I think it's just an essential essential contribution to things. And um, when I post this to YouTube, I'll I'll have the um, people that are listening to it in that way. There'll be a link to Siglio Press uh, in the description for people to look at these books. I cannot wait to see more about the the last thing that you showed. Looks yes, Chris mind blowing. Russell. Cosmos by Vital Gomberwich, and um, there will be more as soon as. As soon as we have a pub date. Okay, I cannot wait. Thank you and so much. About- this is next next week for um, uh, Symposium fans, we will have mini comic artist Anna Wolf. Um, it'll be at the same time, Tuesday at the same time. You can register in the same way. Thank you so much. Oh, oh thanks, good. Austin. Thanks, everybody. Last, uh, oh, 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 yes. Michael has one last thing he wants to say. Yes. Just, just quick another another shout out to to Richard Kraft and and is uh, gorgeous here comes giddy uh, book oh uh, thank you yeah for people tuning in interested in, in comics anyway that's <laughs> and that's that's right? on this am thing. i right <laughs> anyway so thanks okay I'm, and, I'm, and all the oh no that's thank you michael and all the books that you mentioned i mean they're they're all they're all still available on the siglio site yep. correct Okay. They are. They are. And if people sign up for the mailing list, I always send out, you know, like every few months a newsletter with a discount code and stuff too. So um, sign up for the mailing list. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Thanks, Austin. Bye, everyone.